other, right. healing one another through our stories and just sharing that that did something. I believe that ignited us to be even aware of, you know, our sisters, not just a part of this book project, but just um, as a whole to be aware of, you know, what their process looks like. And, you know, everybody has work to do and your <laughs> workload looks different than the next and it's okay. But, it, but the, having that circle of women that, you know, you're not alone, it does something to you. It ignites you to even put um, your feet to the pavement and really truly do the work to be free. Yes. Freedom is our birthright. Absolutely. Absolutely. now sing melodies of victory volume one and these are the stories of women survivors of domestic violence and breast cancer so thank you and if um we can kind of just um see who we have um at the table with us we have Ms. Takara nicole we have janet mack we have desiree deidre washington as well as elaine so thank you, um, thank you for, for sharing this space with me. And so um, I'm Takara Nicole. I have a publishing company and apparel line, and also um, I'm a life coach. Um, I call myself the identity architect and coach as I literally work with millennial and generation X women to help them to discover their identity by using positive energy, sensitivity, and discernment. And so with this book project, um, this was an idea that literally came like at three o'clock in the morning. Um, God tends to, that's my time, um, between anywhere between 2.50-ish and no later than four o'clock in the morning, I'm up and we've had a conversation or he's on praying or downloads come. And um, with this book project, I literally got waking up out of my sleep with it. Um, I have a maybe not the best habit of sleeping with my phone in my bed. Um, I used to manage student housing developments back in my day and lived on property. So it became a habit for me to sleep with my phone in my bed because you never know what's going to happen in a fire or whatever. And so those that mindset has is still with me. Um, I get fussed about it from time to time for my significant other um, because notifications go off you know people like to email you at three o'clock in the morning and all that good stuff but anyways um this morning that I had this idea it was perfect because I literally put it in my phone and I, I was kind of puzzled about it at first being very honest I said my battle scar sing melodies of victory I said okay God what do you want me to do with this and he said this is a book project I said okay God cool and he said it's going to be in different volumes I said, okay, where God, where do I start? And so here we are with women who survived domestic violence and breast cancer. Um, the idea was originally to get the book out in the month of October as we honor and celebrate those women who are indeed survivors of breast cancer and domestic violence. However, God took it a different way. And so um, just thankful that I did not lose momentum when God took it a different way. Um, there is an amazing saying out there that if you really want to laugh super hard, I'm probably over-exaggerating, um, think that your plans are going to work over the plans of God, right? And so um, I did a call. I did a call for action. I posted on my Facebook page, you know, women who were willing to share their stories um, about domestic violence and breast cancer. And at first, it was a large number of women who came to the table with just domestic violence. And it blew my mind because 
if I was to go back on my Facebook page, I had so many women chiming in for days, no joke. Hey, me, me, me. I would love to share. This is what happened to me. And it just, there were some days where I literally cried because I said, you know what? This is something that happens more than we talk about. Um, we're aware of domestic violence, but a lot of times we don't, um, that's it. It's, we're just aware and we move on. Um, we really don't take the time to get to know people who actually gone through it um, and what that looks like from their eyes in reference to their mindset. Um, you know, just all of that comes with being in a domestic violence uh, relationship. And so I found these women and to this day, Deidre and I don't know how we connected on Facebook. We sat and tried to figure it out. We were just like, oh, praise Jesus. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how I connected with Janet either. I don't remember where that came from. However, I am very mindful and very present in the fact that there's no mistakes. God does not make any mistakes at all whatsoever. And so I'm so elated to be able to have worked with these women and continue to work with these women. We have more work to do together um, as a sisterhood to be able I, to really um, come together and help other women and men understand domestic violence. Because a lot of times when we talk about domestic violence, we, we talk about it from the woman's perspective. However, I truly believe the more and more that we share, we're going to be able to change the minds of some of these men and not understanding when they put their hands on a woman, what does that mean? And even when some women put their hands on a man, what does that look like? There's a lot of men out here who are silently suffering because they have to, because they're big and they're bold and they're strong and they've gone through these things, but I'm a man. How can I tell the world or even my friend, my neighbor, or my colleague, whomever, that I'm in a domestic violence situation and I'm letting this woman beat on me. I'm letting this woman talk crazy to me. You know, so all these other things, because when we think about domestic violence, we automatically think physical. It's bigger than physical. A lot of it has to do with mental, psychological. The words stick with us more than anything. So thinking about your battle scars, taking them and shift them into melodies of victory simply means that we're here to literally tell people our stories and allowing our melodies be the voices that we have to empower other people. Right. Um, my name is Janet Mack. I'm an evangelist, uh, among many other things, a mother. Uh, my profession is as a mental health counselor and domestic violence case manager, I deal directly with the court systems. I deal directly with the victims who are coming straight out of their battered situations now in counseling or now in my shelter, uh, seeking support and help. So when they come to me um, in my office, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one counseling. And I just recently completed um, in December of last year, my domestic violence advocate um, certificate here in the state of New Jersey. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting some very strong men. And I'd like to, in to introduce those who have been victims of domestic violence as strong men for one reason. We know physically their brute strength can, be, can overpower a woman. But many of the of when, men whom I've interviewed and talked with um, from a domestic violence support standpoint, they have shared with me, they choose not to hit a woman. Part of it is their upbringing. Um, many of them were very close to their mothers and their mothers taught them never to hit a woman. Um, many of them have values that they believed and standards that they, they know that they can, up, you know, they can overpower the woman. However, they have children. Um, this one particular and man, and in, 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 um, I met him at the library, interesting enough, and we were just talking, and he was actually in, in the, he had just got out of the hospital where this woman had grabbed him by the throat. And you know, ladies, we like to wear our coffin nails, right? So in his resistance to hit her, 
as he shared with me, he, he, he was raised not to hit a woman. And she was very aggressive, very verbal um, in his face and just grabbed him by the neck. And when she started choking him, her nails punctured his throat and he, he blacked out. So when we, when we recognized men, and then the end of that story was um, she called the police and made up this because she thought she had killed him because he had blacked out. She made up a story to the police that, you know, he, there was a domestic violence situation and she reacted and she doesn't know what's going on with her husband, right? Police gets there, they assess the situation, he says, and um, she's told this story. He's in the back of the room. He's come to, come to himself now and he's in the back of the room <clears throat> and the police comes and grab him and arrest him and get ready to arrest him. And he's like, what's going on? What's happening? Why are you here? But he explains the story and he goes, no, that's not true. And they, he goes back and forth. So, he, so the police actually examined her fingernails and saw the tissue and blood under her nails. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, I would never hit a woman. I, I was raised not to hit a woman. And I did not hit my wife. And they had a one, one month old baby. And so the police actually took her down, took both of them down, but she was arrested and pressed charges. And he refused to press charges against her because he was the mother. She, he, she told me that she was the mother of his child and that he, he knew the importance of a child having his mother to raise them. And he was willing to, you know, separate from her if this is what she wanted so that she could still be with her child. But because of the the police examining him, they were able to take the case in their own hands because they had evidence. And this is what we want to help educate and empower and, and let people know that now the new laws on the books and the new methods in which the police department are being trained now on domestic violence, it doesn't matter who's the batterer anymore. It's a level playing field. And the laws on the books go such as that. You know, whoever is the aggressor is the one who will, be, you know, receive the, the punishment, if you will. So I, I work firsthand in the court systems with the, um, with the victims when they go to court. And, you know, sometimes the advocate, as an advocate, they need someone to talk to. They need someone that they can debrief with, that they can pull themselves together before they go before the judge to make their de decree as far as what they want or what they would like to see happen. Um, and, and so I've heard, I began to hear many stories like that as I traveled and, and went to different areas. I was at the courthouse and I was in court with a, with a client and the other gentleman that was there pleading his case was the same thing. And the lady took his children and fled to North Carolina. So the, the aggressor, it doesn't matter. It's the same emotional and psychological effects as Takara expressed earlier on the victim. And so just to help shed some light in that area, as far as what she was speaking on, what of our experiences with those who are male victims. And, and these are some of the things that I've experienced and ran across since I've been working as an advocate. Um, my own personal story, I, I'm a preacher's kid and I was raised in a Christian home. And my parents had domestic violence in their home, but they kept it secret. And many times, as leaders in the church and pastors, you don't want to disclose, disclose that there is battery and, and, and domestic violence going on. And it extends further than just a physical hit. It's, it's in verbal. Um, and the verbal sometimes, it, it, it sets, it, 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 it makes a, a statement stronger than just a physical hit. You can get over a bruise. You know, the pain that you, you hit, and I can get over the, hit, the pain. But the, but the verbal, it sticks with you. It, 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 it plays in your, in your background, in your subconscious.